So I'm very, very excited to introduce our panel coming forward. This panel is about understanding the impact of whistleblower rewards. And we have Stephen Cohn, who I mentioned, author of the Whistleblower Handbook and experienced whistleblower attorney. But we also have, and I'm so excited to announce this, Harvard Business School professors, Aisha Day and Jonas Heath, who have dedicated so much of their research to understanding what motivates whistleblowers and why they decide to come forward. So please, you all join us for this panel. First off, I want to welcome everyone again to the National Whistleblower Day celebrations that uh, the NWC National Whistleblower Center and Whistleblower Network News are sponsoring worldwide. And today, I'm facilitating a panel with two distinguished professors from the Harvard University School of Business, Aisha Day and jo Jonas Hess. Uh, before I officially introduce them, I want to say the following. Academic studies have been critical to promoting effective whistleblower laws. The reason is simple. Whistleblowers face tremendous opposition and some very well-funded entities such as the Chamber of Commerce have been in the tradition of publishing these big reports about why whistleblowers are just a skunk in the picnic and should be ignored. On the other hand, prosecutors and enforcement offices continuously report back that whistleblowers are essential sources of information. And there's just a lot of cases out there where the government has relied upon whistleblowers and has collected a lot of money. If you listen to people like Senator Grassley, you'll see that cases where they've saved lives, protected the environment, exposed wrongdoing. But, met, but much of this information is what you may call antidotal. It's, there's a case and the case looks great. And everyone says, yeah, this is really, we should be supporting these whistleblowers. But then you have on the other side, people say, yeah, that was a good case, but these laws really don't work. They facilitate frivolous complaints. They cost us a lot of money, get rid of them. So where's the balance? And the balance we have found has been in some honest, objective, thorough academic studies that really should have ended the debate some time ago. And, and uh, they're so significant. So the most important one, I think, among it, there was a University of Chicago study back in 2007, which kind of pioneered the way. And now there's a new study at a Harvard University Business School that, that looks at a massively large sample of cases, the largest sample ever over the longest period of time and reviews the documentation objectively with every finding being backed up by massive amount of data. In short, it's the best single study to come out on whether these whistleblower laws work and should be expanded or not. And I know the, the, the scholars who are involved are still working on these issues and coming up with new proposals and there's even other studies, but this is a, a monumental landmark in the academic contribution, in my view, to fighting corruption and holding fraudsters accountable. So again, we're so honored to have these two professors available during whistleblower week and during our celebrations to answer questions, to uh, explain what they did and what they found. So Aisha Day and Johannes Hess are associate professors at the Harvard Business School. In their research, they focus on corporate governance, including the important role of 
whistleblowers play to expose and prevent corporate misconduct. I just want to stop right there. To, and I want to say this to all the whistleblowers who are listening. Yes, you are having impact. The fact that a school like Harvard with professors with their reputations find it important to study the impact of what you are doing speaks for itself. The professors have have award-winning academic work which have informed policy initiatives and informed the actions of regulators. And believe me, the National Whistleblower Center will be adding to the fuel of these uh, initiatives. Furthermore, they've written multiple case studies on these topics and, and teach at the, business, at the Harvard Business School and elsewhere. And uh, they've shared with me some of their other studies, which are also really interesting, very significant. But today we're gonna focus on their article that's entitled, Cash for Information Whistleblower Programs, the effects on whistleblowing and the consequences for whistleblowing. Uh, so uh, I've introduced, and now I'm gonna ask our two distinguished professors, they can start, whomever wants to start it up first, to, to give a, a brief summary of their academic work, and then we'll follow up with questions. So I'm not sure who goes first here. I'll go. Uh, Jonas very graciously uh, allowed me to go first. But um, I wanted to start by saying uh, thank you, Stephen, so much for the extremely kind, uh, very generous introduction. Uh, it's really our honor to be able to be here and so we can speak a little bit about our work uh, and actually have an opportunity to interact and answer questions on this topic. Um, uh, you know, you gave a great summary uh, of our research, but just to provide uh, a little bit of context, uh, if you look at the data, um, you know, fraud is like a, a big issue worldwide, not just in the US or any one particular country. And in the last decade, uh, corporate criminal liabilities have increased by about 80%. And that figure is a more than 4 trillion right now. In fact, uh, a survey by the certified fraud examiners have suggested that um, companies on average are, are pay about 5% of their revenues towards fraud. So it is a big problem. And one of the topics that Jonas and I have studied is, uh, is really what drives fraud? And more importantly, what are the ways we can limit or prevent fraud? And what are these mechanisms both within firms as well as outside firms? And that's where this topic comes in because one of the key mechanisms are regulators who use whistleblower um, policies and protections as a key um, enforcement tool. And, and that's kind of uh, gotten us motivated to, a to do a bunch of studies on this topic because really the area is, there's so much to do. Uh, and I know we are focusing on one paper and Jonas in fact has a lot more uh, research on this, but really the goal is overall to benefit people, corporations, society and, and limit fraud using perhaps one of the strongest enforcement tools out there, which is the employees or whistleblowers um, in general. Um, Jonas, you wanna? Yeah, thank you Aisha. And also thank you Steve for this great introduction. Um, yeah, maybe before we jump into the Q&A, and Aisha and I are both super excited to discuss our paper in more detail with you, but maybe it's helpful if we can just give a very brief overview about what we actually did in this specific paper and what we found. So at a high level, Steve, and you kind of touch upon those kind of things, is, um, there are two questions that we try to answer in this, uh, in this paper. The first one really is, what is the effect of greater financial incentives on whistleblowing? So how does it shape how whistleblowers behave? And then the second thing is, uh, how costly is whistleblowing? And especially as soon as we compare these costs to the rewards, the financial compensation that these whistleblowers receive, how do these two compare? And so as you mentioned, Steve, the, the fundamental problem that also we as researchers run in is normally it's very, very hard to get a lot of data on these uh, type of to answer these types of questions. And so what we did here in this specific paper, we looked at the False Claims Act. So again, that's the law um, um, that covers fraud against the government. So if you are an individual and you believe you have information 
that some company defrauded the government, you can file a lawsuit on behalf of the government. And if the government uh, establishes and supports and finds uh, that these allegations are actually true, you're eligible for a uh, re financial reward. And so we collect thousands of these lawsuits. And then as a first step, we try to understand, okay, so what happens? So you now have these financial incentives. What actually happens? Are employees likely to just directly contact regulators? That's one of the concerns that you hear quite often from companies. You know, if it's like this great option, I can just run to the regulator. I can get all of this money. And actually, we do not find any support for that. So employees um, want to resolve issues internally. And then the, the next question is, now that we are offering financial incentives as a regulators, um, are, we, are we being flooded with frivolous lawsuits? And again, we don't find this. If anything, we find the opposite. We find, yes, there are more lawsuits that regulators receive, but if anything, they're of higher quality. So they have a higher likelihood to be settled. So that's the first, those are the key findings from the first question that we tackle. And the second question is then really around this idea of how costly is it to, to blow the whistle? And so we really looked um, in detail, we tracked one of the, the key advantages, at least for us as researchers, is that under the False Claims Act, you can identify who these uh, whistleblowers are. So we can track what happens to them over a longer period of time. And um, what we find, and yeah, that is, um, that's maybe not such great news, is we find um, many of them have high initial costs. Many of them report that there was some form of retaliation against them. Many of them also reported um, that they got fired in response to raising the issue internally. But then in the longer run, um, we, we actually find that the, the costs are maybe not as severe as previously thought. And in particular, what we find, and we can go into more detail in the Q&A, particular what we find is the money that you receive as a reward typically compensates for your uh, expected future income loss. So if anything is like a compensation, it's not a super strong reward, but if anything, the reward helps to compensate for, um, for this, for these costs of whistleblowing. So what are the three uh, key takeaways from the study? And then we can open it up for Q&A. The first thing is, yeah, these uh, financial incentives are good. They don't result in, uh, in all of these concerns that um, companies and other um, parties actually had. So you get better tips of higher qualities, more of them. That's good. That benefits taxpayers in this specific setting because you can detect this fraud against the government. Second thing is for companies, what we can see here in, in our data is um, something, quite often something goes wrong within the company and that then triggers employees to contact the authorities. And so, for example, what we see, which could be quite interesting, is that within our sample, employees rarely ever use a hotline. They seem to be talking to their supervisor, their boss, and then something goes wrong. So there's something maybe for companies to think about how can they create a better, more safer environment for employees to speak up. And the last thing for whistleblowers would be, yes, it's really, really costly, and we are fully aware it takes a lot to be a whistleblower, but maybe if we look over this larger sample of individuals, maybe the costs are not as bad as we um, previously thought. Thank you, and I think uh, Isha and I are both looking forward to your questions. You, you're still on mute, Steve. So my first response is very simple. Wow. Wow. These researchers have looked over, how much data did you look over to come to these conclusions? How many case studies, how many cases? How many Almost 2000 individual lawsuits. And the reason they could do that is in the False Claims Act, ultimately each case becomes public, even though it might be filed under seal. So you can examine, you can figure out who the whistleblower was, how much compensation was given, what they were blowing the whistle on, that will become part of a public record. Now mark my word, no one has ever gone into the public record as these researchers have and extensively reviewed it. It's a massive job, a great public service. 
Uh, and it also separates the, the False Claims Act is really similar to the Dodd-Frank Act that has a lot of people working in it. But that program is anonymous and confidential and very hard to get data from. So they got data where they could. Also, False Claims has been around for over 30 years. So any one year you can have anomalies, but it really gave you know, gives the researchers this opportunity to look over a reward program over an extended period of time. And that's why I really say that this study is so significant. Uh, so, and I say, wow, because the conclusions are very powerful, very powerful. So the first question I have, and I'm just gonna throw it out to both of you. I may start asking one or the other, but please, whoever wants to start and chime on in, like what, got you started? Why did you get into this research? Um, I, I can go, um, you know, there were uh, so many, there's, um, of course, the academic curiosity was one. But uh, even before, I, I remember um, Jonas and I uh, have had in different ways uh, interacted with the SEC uh, uh, here in, in the US. Like I've been there as an economist for a year. Jonas has presented much of his research. And one of the things, uh, you know, regulators have often said that, you know, we would love to have a more proactive approach to enforcing fraud versus a reactive approach where we come in after the fact, when much of the cost has happened, people have lost a lot of money, you know, resources are lost. But if something like a whistleblower program, which is more proactive, we try to, you know, try to stop it before its progress so far is something we want to focus on. So that already got us interested in, okay, this is a, you know, the regulators want to do this. Let's try to study it. What can they benefit from? So that was one reason we got interested in it. So we started digging up the academic literature on it and we and we saw like what are the policies in place so that that's where we learned, okay, there are, it can be anonymous or not. Now the, a, a recent push and, and controversy as well is on these bounty schemes. So that got us to understanding, well, what's the controversy about? Like, what's the problem? And then we see these two sides, one that is pro the bounty of financial incentives, which says, well, you have to compensate them for the cost because it's very costly for whistleblowers to come forward. So you have to offer some kind of compensation, which is gonna make them, incentivize them to come forward. But on the other hand, you would have critics that would say, but you offer someone incentives like that, you'll have more disgruntled employees or um, other people who have a beef with the firm are gonna come forward. There's gonna be frivolous tips. Regulators are gonna be flooded with all of these tips that they can't handle. So it's really counterproductive, which got us to think about, well, these are compelling arguments. And we had written multiple case studies, uh, like looking at one by one situations where it didn't seem to be that way, but we're like, well, that's just one example. We need to do a broad sample study to really understand the effect of financial incentives. So then we started digging, well, is there data? We need a large sample because there didn't seem to be any, like you mentioned, Stephen, uh, that you know, data is a big problem. And, and that's where actually uh, Jonas, and by the way, we have another colleague of us, uh, Gerardo, who, is, who was also at HBS at the time, who is a co-author in this paper. And Jonas and Gerardo had used this data on another study and they said, well, let's dig into this FCA a lawsuits database and see what we can do over there. So it was really a multi, pronged reason, a regulatory interest in being more proactive about curtailing fraud, our you know, interest in the topic and trying to understand the academic controversies, our case studies that didn't seem to be on the side of the critics, but again, we couldn't conclude anything. Uh, and so all of those together made us decide, let's, let's go and try to solve this, or at least given the limitations of a research paper, try to do a deeper analysis. So that's how we really got interested great uh, do you want to add anything uh, Jonas? I, I think the, the 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 one thing that is really important to also emphasize is this this false claims act maybe not everyone is super familiar with it but it's kind of the blueprint for all cash for information um, bounty schemes that are out there and so yes the problem is so the, the sec always says we want to know what is the effect of these incentives we want to know we really want to understand all of these dynamics but we can never ever share any data with you because um we pro we, re we are really 
serious about protecting the identity. So you're a little bit in this, okay, you wanna do this, you wanna examine this, but how are you supposed to do this? And the interesting thing is that the False Claims Act not only allows you to get the data, but it's also conceptually, and I think Steve, you pointed at that, it's also the, the blueprint for um, actually this Dodd-Frank uh, SEC whistleblower um, program. So it's also intuitive to look at the uh, False Claims Act to maybe more broadly speak about the effect of uh, cash flow information with super oil programs. Yeah, and, and in point of fact, there's there's almost, there's no real difference between the False Claims Act and Dodd-Frank. What each law does is identifies a specific type of fraud and it covers just that lane. So False Claims Act is fraud against the government, generally government contracting, Medicare, Medicaid fraud, uh, if you lie to get a grant, if you're trying to fulfill a grant, but you do like improper materials, it's traditional fraud, but in the area of government procurement and services. And Dodd-Frank is pretty much the same. It's traditional fraud in the area of securities. So the underlying type of misbehavior is very similar. But in all of our whistleblower laws, we don't have a general law. They all cover very specific areas, commodities, securities, tax, et cetera. So, but from my experience as a lawyer doing this for 35 years, there's really no difference. Someone walks in. In fact, we often file multiple lawsuits from one case. We've had a case that was very successful, false claims, tax, and securities. All of which we won, but they were all, you know, because the fraudsters were very busy uh, violating the law. They, 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 they could, just couldn't stop, you know? It's just the way it is sometimes. Uh, the, I do want to ask you another thing about this proactive and speaking to the regulators. In looking at the way the EPA, uh, the SEC structured their regulations, implementing Dodd Frank. It's very clear that they were looking for proactive. They were looking to try to induce whistleblowers to give information either to the company or to the commission while the fraud was ongoing, or you know, you know, not waiting till there's a violation to get it right at the earliest possible moment. A lot of incentives to be quick in reporting. So you mentioned that they had raised to you this issue of proactive. Do you want to give any other just discussion on that? Because I find it so interesting. They, they never really articulated that in the rulemaking when I was participating in it, that this was a major motive, but it was very clear that that's what their regulations were pointing to. So I'm actually kind of curious if they gave you any other insight into what they meant by proactive and how they may want to use these reward laws to increase proactive reporting, if they did. Um, really, uh, th this was, um, I was visiting there as an economist and we were like working on several policy initiatives. So I would have a lot of discussions with people in the enforcement team and I was in the economic analysis team. And, you know, in the course of our conversations, we would talk about future policies and I'm particularly interested in governance and governance mechanisms, enforcement tools. So we would have these discussions, but but you know the the regulator's motive is is always to try to limit the waste you know limit cost and fraud and misbehavior at the soonest possible time and not to have it start to begin with if possible and so that's always kind of uh, their their goal so all of the regulations the the way they the so called reactive methods are reactive because you know you kind of find out after the fact which is a problem but their hope even there is by having these huge penalties in place, it will deter fraud ex ante. That's the hope with that. But unfortunately, very um, stubborn fraudsters, like you say, they still go at it. And then so it becomes more reactive. So, so their thing was, you know, who has the most information about ongoing misbehavior? People closest to the, to the misbehavior. And in the corporate setting, that's most likely employees at a firm. So how do we get them to tell us before you know, we wait till you know really bad things happen. And in fact, there was a, a research study which has shown that thanks to whistleblowing, 
Typically, uh, the fraud that has been uncovered due to whistleblowing has is 17 times less costly than the more fraud that has actually. So wow. you've saved quite a bit, which is intuitive, right? I mean, uh, the, the, the brave whistleblowers who come forward when they see something at an early stage are probably preventing years of um, potential loss. So um, I just want to say that's incredible. And if you can share information about that study, even if it's informal, whatever, later on, I'd love to take a look at that. I'm not aware of that study, but I would love to read it. And I just want to say one thing to the whistleblowers and whistleblower lawyers who might be listening in and either right now live or later when this is uh, placed online. The rules incentivize early reporting. They all have what's known as a first to file. So whoever comes in first qualifies. And in fact, if you come in second, you may end up with nothing if the person who came in first provided the information. They're all designed to incentivize early reporting. I know that there are many, many whistleblowers who are afraid, of, and we'll get into the retaliation next, they are afraid to come forward. I've dealt with them on a confidential basis. They come in and they may take months to actually decide to blow the whistle. And some never do because the fear factor and there's distrust. And will I ever get an award? Many issues, but they coming in early and you've just heard it. You've heard it from the scholars, but you're also gonna hear from the lawyer. That's what they're looking for. So now I have, let's just move it to a, another thing, which is there is not a person out there who is thinking of reporting wrongdoing that is not either in the front of their mind or the back, fearful of retaliation. And that holds back most reporting, whether it will ever happen or not, that is what holds people back. So I know your study also had looked very carefully at the financial impact of whistleblowing. I think had some really interesting findings. So if you want to just, uh, and Johannes, we'll start with you on this and then move forward. Just kind of outline what your actual findings were. First question I have, but before you tell us, were your conclusions and your findings consistent with what you thought you would find when you started your inquiry? Yeah, so, so it goes, um, so let's directly address that question. Um, so I, part of the problem and part of the reason to really do this study is that we kind of only had anecdotes about cost of whistleblowing. And then what do these anecdotes typically focus on? It's these highly public cases where it's super clear that there was some form of retaliation, but it's a very, very small number of cases at the end of the day. And it was really, really difficult for us uh, to even come up with a good prediction. Is this now, is this representative of what happens to everyone? Are these outliers? Because these are just these massive frauds and that is why um, the company reacted so strongly or, or what's really going on. And the, the other thing that we really try to understand is um, a lot of that, um, these, these anecdotes kind of focus on what happened in the situation and around the time that you disclose the problem. But what we also wanted to understand is what really happens over a longer period of time so that we get to a more informed long-term view about the costs of whistleblowing. And so then, then what did we do? Um, the, the first the first thing here that is, um, I think, important to keep in, in key, uh, keep in mind, roughly 50% of the, um, the employee whistleblowers in our sample first reported the issue internally. And so in their lawsuits, in their filings, um, we could actually see what happened. What was the situation there? That's kind of an open text. We're describing what happened to them. And as you said, Steve, we took the time to go through all of these, yeah, like almost 2,000 of these lawsuits, trying to identify what actually happened in each of these cases. And we try to, as a first step, focus on two things. How did the company typically respond to it? Quite often, at least from the, pers at least from the perspective of the whistleblower, so let's recall, it's the perspective of the whistleblower, 
um, the whistleblower felt the company was actually not really responding to this uh, to the allegation and ignoring it. But then on top, and that really gets at this retaliation thing, that um, many, I think roughly 40% of those employees said they got fired in response of um, raising the issue internally. Again, we cannot verify that. That's the, the text, that's what the whistleblower stated, but that's what they said in the lawsuit filings. And then, of course, there are all the other types of um, retaliation, harassment, you don't get promoted, et cetera, et cetera. So that is like this initial thing. But then what we also try to look at is what happens over a longer period of time. And so what we did is we looked at both the social cost to you. What do we mean with social costs? Like, are you more likely um, to get divorced, for example, because this whistleblowing creates such a stress, emotional stress on, on you and your uh, family that maybe, yeah, it breaks up, for example. We do not find evidence of uh, social costs or we do not find that whistleblowers are more likely to have these social costs than non-whistleblowers. But what we find is then we, we looked at the financial implications and what we found is there is an income loss. It's roughly seven to eight percent and it's very, very sticky. So we looked at, we compared, what we really did is we compared a whistleblower to him or herself before they blew the whistle to a non-whistleblower who worked at the same company in a similar role, being of the similar age, similar gender, and tracked what happens to their income over time. And so we could compare that. And so, as I said, um, someone who blew the whistle roughly has a seven to eight percent um, lower lifetime income. So we checked after one year, five years, 10 years. So it's very, very sticky. Um, it's perhaps not massive, but it is definitely um, a significant income loss, a pretty sticky income loss. Aisha, do you want to follow up on this? Anything to add? Because I, I have something I want to add that you didn't say in your study, but I picked up in your study. Uh, I mean, you want to go ahead, Stephen? I can... Sure. This is what I found so fascinating in your study. So in my world, there are bad stereotypes about whistleblowers. You know, uh, they just exist. You know, they just like, do they have a personality problem and all this other, in my view, nonsense. Now I've worked with whistleblowers for 35, at least 35 years, maybe more by now, since 84. I'm not, you, know, you guys are the economists, you can figure out all those numbers, but I've been doing it for a while. And it just struck me that, you know, the whistleblowers aren't, they don't follow any of those stereotypes. I mean, they're just solid people. In fact, many of, them, many of them are the smartest, best, most loyal. You know, everyone thinks the whistleblower is disloyal. No, loyal, dedicated, which is very counter to just a lot of popular misconception. But you, but that's something that was buried in your numbers. All of a sudden, they're not like, crazy people getting divorced. No, it was the same numbers. When you looked at the social statistics, they were pretty much like regular people. And when you looked at like, when they were able finally to find a job after say they got fired, they maybe unemployed for a year, they got their life back. They were essentially making maybe 7% less, but back into the workforce, they weren't living in cars, becoming homeless, you know, and it's, because obviously that happens to some people. Uh, but what I want to add, actually, actually, Stephen, I want to quickly add that yeah. the reason we wanted to look at these things, like you said in the first place, was because we actually looked at other literatures, including the medical literature, etc., which has actually found that people who have gone through whistleblowing lawsuits, etc., have ultimately had issues with. Um, They've started breaking the law. They've had severe mental health problems, depression. So, you know, they have family issues like divorce. So because the medical literature showed that, we were like, well, you know, they're looking at samples. It's a smaller sample. So let's look in our larger. Is there evidence that on average that's what happened? So that actually did was sort of a motivation for us to look at these dimensions as well. So just well, to and I'm so happy you did because. Obviously, in that very, very, very good study from the New England School of Medicine, 
or their journal, but obviously there are doctors, there are medical people, they're pulling a sample yeah. and they're focused on that. I'll tell you, it's like funny, we even once had a case, so, you know, uh, a retaliation case, compensatory damages, emotional distress. So we called in, we had a very honest uh, psychologist, a great guy, and, and we were convinced our whistleblower had PTSD and all these issues. We had him totally diagnosed. He came back and said, there's no issue here. You don't have any compensatory damages. So we never asked for it. We're not those type of people that try to make something up. We really aren't. So it just was the way. But I will tell you, what you found there is what I see. And in fact, you didn't pick up on this. I don't think you can. But when you actually think it through, you know, who would put themselves at risk to do the right thing? Who would actually be concerned that there was some form of corruption and not just walking in, getting their paycheck, checking the boxes? Who is that person? And I have learned over time, that's the person you want on your side. And I'll tell you, so many businesses just are cutting their own throat. They're, they're losing the ones that get rid of the whistleblowers or try to screen them out, they're losing really some of the best people. I also find they're super smart and, and usually way smarter than myself. I mean, they're really smart people, but that's, so I, I'm a biased guy, okay. But so, uh, Stephen, that's something that Jonas and I have often talked about and our hopefully it's in our list of future studies as to, and we've actually done a case on, on this exactly personality, who is likely to whistleblow. Of course, in this study, we can't talk about it because we haven't studied it. We haven't looked at personality yeah. profile. So we can't say anything, but that just to point out, that's a great point you mentioned because that is on a to-do list of- uh, yeah. and, and, but, but your study really does it because it really just mainstreams these whistleblowers right back in. In other words, that, that you didn't find a statistical spike on any type of aberrant behavior. So, you know, I, I think they did a good job. But one question I have, which you didn't quite answer yet, and Aisha, I'll start with you on this one, is what did you, uh, first on the retaliation issue, what did you expect to find? Did you, when you started, did you expect that the social consequences would be in the normal range or that most of the people would be able to find jobs and only have like a seven or eight percent hit. Is that what you expected, or did that take you by surprise? You know, it was not a surprise really because first, you know, we had that uh, uh, Zingales paper out of University of Chicago that says, you know, the costs are horrendous. I, in fact, they have a direct quote saying, "We are not surprised that few whistleblowers come forward. We are surprised that any come forward at all, given that there are costs." So what, what they put it as, they are shocked that anyone comes forward at all. But what we thought is that, well, why do they come forward then? Maybe the costs are not as horrible as they think and they have a small sample. And we did uh, individual case studies, which as I would say, which suggested that, of course the immediate costs are very high, but a lot of them go back into the mainstream, but that was just one or two anecdotes, right? We can't make a larger deal. And then the fact that despite what Zingales and all are finding, they, they're they surprised that people are coming forward, but maybe it's not that surprising if you really... So, you know, honestly, we were not as convinced that it's prohibitive, but we, were, we wouldn't be surprised if we knew it would be costly. Of course, it's costly, right? But we were not that taken aback that, uh, you know, it's not as prohibitive as, as it seems. But we kept an agnostic view because, you know, it, the Zingales is, an, is a fantastic, I mean, they, they, they clearly did a good study. So it, it's possible in the longer run, it would end up being um, hard. But, but uh, it wasn't as, I don't know what your views are, Jonas, at least to me, then why are they? I mean, it, it, there must be, plus the, and the cases, the corporate cases we studied suggested that maybe it's um, not, not as, so, I don't know, to answer your question, this is the spirit of research. You don't know because there's a compelling alternative hypothesis. So you don't really know, which is sort of the thrill of finding out. So we didn't know uh, really, but I don't think we were that surprised that in the longer term, a lot of these 
substantial amount, not everybody, of course, did find their ba way back. And in fact, some ended up with better positions than at the point of the lawsuit. So I, I do have to uh, point out though, in our sample, most of the whistleblowers are rank and file. I, I, it's a, it's a, if you want to call it a, a limitation caveat, because the, that's the, the type of whistleblower, only 4% of our sample was senior management. Most of it was rank and file and some middle management. And actually one reason, although we cannot, we have not verified this or tested this, or we think one reason could be again, the, the cash, the amount of financial incentives, because the amount of financial incentives offered covers potentially the costs, the lower down employees face, but for top management, the costs are much, much higher and they probably perceive the financial rewards as not compensatory or not full, you know, substituting for the cost. So they don't come forward as often, but of course there can be other factors. They could be involved. There could be a reputation cause so many things. So that's why I, I don't want to say anything much because we haven't studied it in depth. Again, another thing on our to-do list, but we do want to point out that our sample has mostly the rank and file um, employee positions. There's, there's one, one small element to also keep in mind. The original Zingale study also looked at the cost of whistleblowing before the cash for information program was available. So part of the magic here is, yeah, we, it, it wasn't super clear where the social cost would fall, but in terms of the financial costs, we knew that those individuals, the whistleblowers, can also expect to collect some compensation for those costs. So as a result, uh, we, we, I think it was reasonable to expect that some people uh, are willing to speak up and share that information. But then we actually get to the point that Isha just mentioned at the very end, which I think is very important. You could raise the question of whether or not those financial rewards are actually big enough or large enough for senior executives to speak up because their costs are also uh, higher for speaking up. So let me, I'll just respond with a couple of points, which is, that you talked about and you found that many people were fired, like 40%, and then others suffered. So you have to start in terms of, and this is just my view, having dealt with this with employee behavior. One termination will shut up a thousand. It will cause a chilling effect. The rank and file employees won't really follow seven years later, the person gets a million dollar reward, or four years later, they found another job they're gonna see this person fired and they're gonna say is I can't risk that. So it's so interesting. So what your study is fantastic because it, it, it provides empirical data that even if someone is fired, that perhaps the risks of blowing the whistle, blow, blowing the whistle can still, you know, you should be able to still wanna do it and not be so shaken. The University of Chicago study, the one you're talking about, that's what they were looking at. They were looking at a, a person fearing this immediate adverse impact. And then why would they be motivated? And then they concluded that the financial reward would be the only thing that could realistically pull them out. But you're right, that they were looking at it then. They were not looking at the data like you were looking at it. And they had no long-term analysis of where these people ever ended. But now I'll throw something else at you. And I, I don't know how you're going to study this. But one advantage I have of having represented whistleblowers for a long time is we get like 1,000 people to my office. And the National Whistleblower Center gets about two or 3,000. So we have a very large sample of people who are either have blown the whistle or are thinking of it. And it's all just empirical. It's all antidotal because we don't really it's, we just can't keep the stats and it's all attorney client privilege anyway. So why are you gonna keep anything about it? But you kind of registers in your head. Here's what happened. This is just amazing. Before false claims, I started a couple of years before false claims and most of, because false claims was done in 86, I started practicing in 84. We're doing a lot of retaliation cases, which we continue to do. Everyone who blew the whistle would have been just what you saw, middle management and below. That was your whistleblower class. 
And that continued. Very few executives, although an executive may have the best information. Dodd-Frank Act was passed. And the ability for someone to be anonymous and confidential and the requirement that the commission maintain that anonymity, which would mean slowing down the investigation, not using documents that could immediately identify the whistleblower, an entirely new investigative tactic. My first person in my office on Dodd-Frank was the chief executive officer of a multinational corporation. Bingo. Since then, chief financial officer, executive vice president, et cetera. Not all, but I had never seen that before. And I know the commission's getting that. And these folks are walking in with massive amounts of information. It's just one of those things that when it's kind of a combination of everything, but what between the financial incentive and when they felt they could do it securely, things really changed. I just wanted to say that because I did find it so interesting how few people in False Claims Act, because your identity is revealed. So, and that happens to us all the time. That's the one of the very first questions people ask. If I file false claims, will they know who I am? And guess what we have to say? Yes, and that does hold people back. Okay. Can we, Steve, can we yeah. say something? Because uh, Isha and I were are actually really thinking deeply about uh, exactly this question. Because if, if you really think about the main design elements of these whistleblower programs, it's either you offer money, yes or no, and you protect their identity, yes or no. And so like a whistleblower program in the US, for example, where you don't offer money, uh, but protect the identity is like the OSHA whistleblower program. Then the False Claims Act is this interesting program where you offer money, but you do not protect the identity. And then the SEC one is exactly this program where you protect identity and you offer money. And Aisha and I, we really, we're thinking about, uh, and we, we're going to do it with a couple of experiments, um, trying to understand how do these different design feature combinations, how do they make different types of people willing to speak up and how do they also affect the quality of the tips? Because we we have fully we, we have actually heard that story that you just shared a couple of times before, that really this protection of the your identity is really what made a big difference for these top executives to be willing to speak up. But we again we want to get at this a little bit more systematically and try to understand if you are in this in this regime where you don't tell uh, about the identity and you offer money. What do you get then? What type of tips do you get then? And that's one of the big next steps uh, for us to, to investigate. Now, now, I just want to just take my hat off to you again, because you've qualified your research many times, and, and you've talked about the limit to what you may have to do in the future. And uh, one of my clients years ago, we still work with him, Fred Whitehurst, a PhD chemist from the FBI crime lab, who blew the whistle. That's all he would talk about. The data, the data, the data, and don't over infer the data. And it's just what you guys are doing. I just wanna take my hat off. I mean, it's true scholarship. It clearly enhances the uh, credibility of the findings as if it needed any enhancing to begin with. But I think for anyone listening, I mean, these findings are so significant that uh, the reward laws don't increase frivolous filings that they do. What was your finding as to uh, the, if you had one, the, did you reach any conclusions on the impact of these reward laws on effectively combating fraud? I mean, what you want to do. In other words, how did these reward laws interplay with the ability of the government to effectively hold fraudsters accountable, meaning in the context of false claims, protect taxpayer monies. Yeah. So in in a, in a very simple a very simple takeaway is we find um, they get the regulators get more tips of higher quality. So in in other words, it's they can hold um, companies much more accountable for these uh, types of 
frauds. And at the end of the day, it helps taxpayers because we're talking about defrauding the government, so defrauding taxpayers. So, so as I understand it, on the one side, it's more tips of higher quality, but you then also said it didn't seem to interfere with internal reporting and compliance and didn't promote more frivolity. Correct. Correct. It did not affect the likelihood that an employee would not report the issue internally first, because that's a really big concern of companies. It did, we did not find any evidence supporting that. And we also did not find any evidence supporting that um, now employees, for example, just file frivolous lawsuits, but instead more lawsuits of higher quality. Now, uh, another question, and, I, and again, I don't want to put you on the spot or in any way, you know, whatever research you're going to do, because your research was very, very focused and very powerful. But have you thought about any way, and this is to me a gigantic issue, to try to figure out the deterrent effect of these laws? To me, that's a gigantic issue because I know I've met with the commissioners uh, of the SEC during rulemaking proceedings, and I said, look, these laws aren't about rewarding whistleblowers. It's about deterring wrongdoing, the fear of detection. I'm just wondering if either you were able to pick up any of that in your research or whether you have any idea how to potentially figure out to do a scientific study like you've done on this on deterrence. I'm just wondering what your views are on that. No. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, one of my other studies on this, where I also use the False Claims Act as a setting, I'm actually following companies that had a public whistleblower false claims act allegation that got settled. So there was merit was established. They had to pay a penalty. So what are these companies doing? They focus on three elements. So they seem to improve their uh, corporate governance structure, in particular, their board composition. They seem to improve their internal processes uh, and compliance processes and they seem to improve their employee relations, paying employees a little bit more, for example. So they're taking a couple of these comprehensive steps. And then what I find is, I find that those companies are less likely to have public whistleblower fraud allegations in the future. So again, big, big caveat, I don't know if there are now a lot of problems within the companies, or, or if I also don't know if the company becomes now a good or better corporate citizen and doesn't engage in those activities anymore. The only thing I can say is employees in those companies are then going forward less likely um, to report any wrongdoing to, to the government. So there seems to be- so That, that is an incredible funny. And again, I'd like if you can share it yeah. in, the, in the chat and we can share in the future because what's amazing about that is you would think if a whistleblower in a company got a lot of money, and a lot of people will start coming out and blowing more whistles. I guess the company, <laughs> then they take action to prevent it. It's an amazing. Aisha, did you want to comment at all on this? On this? Um, no, I, I really wanted to um, uh, say that in this particular study, we, of course, don't observe the counterfactual. So yeah. it's hard to know how, what did we prove. But there have been other researchers and scholars in accounting and finance who try to look at what happens when a regulation is introduced. Is there a, because it's, if it's a semi unexpected shock, does there, is there a decline in fraud and restatements? And, and in general, there is some evidence that when you introduce something like a Sarbanes-Oxley Act or a Dodd-Frank, or there is an initial at least decline in fraud, restatements, et cetera. So these regulations do have a preventative nature, but then again, we, it's not, doesn't go away. So which means that there are other factors or other motivations. Uh, you know, one of the things I study personal reasons why people commit these crimes, but long story short, several scholars have studied this question broadly and in general regulation trying to hinder fraud does have uh, an effect. Great. So now I'm now going to look at some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, and uh, I'm going to hit in some of them. I definitely would like to get through a lot of these before uh, we have seven more minutes. But the first one I think is very critical, which is many people want to know where to find your research. So this would be this paper and Johannes, your other paper. So can you just 
say like if someone wanted to look this up, where can they find it? Um, you, you can just uh, you can just Google our names, and then uh, you will land on our website, and these papers are listed there on our academic work under our academic work. You click on it, and then you can download it. Alternative, alternatively, we can also just put it here in the chat right now. If you... That would be fantastic if you did. Uh, and I, I know National Whistleblower Center would be very interested in linking to your work or putting it on their website um, along with others. And I think a lot of whistleblower lawyers should really jump on this research. I think it would help their clients and, and help them understand uh, the significance of, of what you've accomplished. Uh, someone has asked how this research has impacted you all personally. You know, so, so that is a great question. So, so having engaged in looking at all these whistleblower cases and all this, has it had any personal impact on you? It's a question. You got to answer it. <laughs> As researchers, they don't want to answer that question, but uh, they ask. You can pass. No, I, you know, I, I have to say that um, one of the reasons, at least part of this paper was actually motivated by a very personal, somewhat interaction. We taught a case on whistleblowing in our class. And at the end, um, I remember we, I, I just asked my students, how many of you have, have or have thought of blowing the whistle? What stopped you? And I have to say, I was really moved by some of their stories. Uh, there were some of them who were like, if I, I, I mean, I, I guess it made me personally respect whistleblowers a lot because some of their stories were they, those that did end up, you know, crossing the hurdle and blowing the whistle had to at least emotionally think about the pros and cons and, and the costs were huge. And then finally they decided this is the right thing to do, even at personal cost. But those that didn't were not any less brave. They probably had more at stake, families, children. So I just want to give a big shout out to all whistleblowers out there. You do such a great job. And, and we recognize after having spoken personally to a lot of whistleblowers through our cases and otherwise, it takes so much courage to do the right thing. So really huge, huge, I don't know, respect um, for, for everything that you do. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to just add one thing. I think that anyone who deals with, like you have objectively with whistleblowers would reach the same conclusion. So as an attorney, we have to deal with them objectively because if we're gonna put someone to a jury or before the SEC or file a claim, you gotta get rid of all the nonsense. You need to go right down to the heart of the matter because it just won't fly any, way, any other way. And, uh, and that's really what's molded my opinion that's been extremely high. Uh, we're running out of time, but I do have just another question. Did you review, there's a paper called Nobody Likes a Rat that talks about uh, groups rejecting truth tellers, even if everyone in the group is a truth teller. It was a sociological study. I'm just wondering if you looked at that and uh, your, if you had any opinions on it. Did you, did you see that one? Uh, nobody likes a rat. Uh, you, you know, I, I haven't seen that, but in one of our, um, one of the academic workshops that was held here at HBS, uh, one of the uh, people were looking at a related study and that's where we, I don't know if it was this paper, but he was talking about the social costs of whist whistleblowing in the sense, once everyone knows you've blown the whistle, other, your co colleagues, they become less friendly or they don't want to tell you much oh my god he's going to go tell someone so that's kind of part of the costs of whistleblowing if you will it's not just retaliation from your employer or the firm it's potential social retaliation from your colleagues as well so i'm sure that's one of the costs um holding and, people back and the reason i ask is because your study was based on objective data and there's so much out there that is antidotal and you also, what I was so impressed is that the way you looked at some of those personal impacts over a long period of time, which no one had ever done. So I will tell you right now, just what you said. Yeah, and that's where I think where that University of Chicago comes in. That first year where you might be being fired and harassed, 
people are afraid to talk. They don't want to be associated with you because they don't want to get called into it. You know, that is what everyone sees and does create a real chilling effect. But one of the most important contributions you have made in addition to, I think, demystifying some of the concerns raised about financial rewards is also demystifying the long-term effect on the personal whistleblower. You really have two for the price of one, but both accomplished through objective economic analysis, which to me, that's the ball game. You know, let's see the numbers. You know, there, you, you can see a million things, but the numbers, and you guys just did a tremendous uh, uh, contribution. So we're running out of time. If there's something like you wouldn't want to make any closing remarks, I think we have another 60 seconds. Uh, if either of you like, I see Siri's coming on in. She probably has a closing remark. Do you, Siri, do you have a closing remark? Or oh, absolutely. I have a closing remark. I just want to say thank you. We rarely get to hear these kinds of academic discussions with folks that are exclusively focusing on whistleblowers and what motivates them. So kudos to your work. I have to say, after discovering your work, I put Harvard Business School on a whole nother level of my appraisal. So definitely got a gold star for me for that. And we really hope to keep the conversation going. As you can see, Stephen is incredibly engaged in this type of academic work, and I'm sure he'd love to continue the conversation for the rest of the day, but we do have to move along. Thank you so much for your insights, everyone. And um, just please connect us with your colleagues. We'd love to hear about their work. I love how you've highlighted how many thinkers went into contributing to the development of your work. And we're just gonna keep following your work and celebrating what you do. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having Thank you. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. So we've heard now from the academics and I'm so grateful to them. It's fantastic when we have this empirical information to support our thinking about whistleblowing. So I've seen in the chat, a lot of you wanna hear exactly where you can find this information. So we will try to send some of those links over into the chat. Um, but otherwise, you can look at our um, press releases and our articles at Whistleblower's blog, and you can find out more about this work there. And of course, I hope we can continue to collaborate.